And now our co-hosts, Charlotte Littlefield and George Butler. Welcome to The Secret Truth. I'm George Butler. Charlotte Littlefield is off tonight. I've got a really fine guest with us this evening, and she's written a fine book entitled Kim Trails Harp and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. Welcome to our program, Elena Freeland. Thanks for having me, George. Boy, I tell you what, you're just a great lady, and I've had you once before uh, a while back, but now I understand you're really branching off into a lot of other things. But first, tell our listening audience a little bit about your background and how you came to write this book. I've been a writer for many years. I'm a ghost writer. I write people's books for them. I'm hired to do that. So I've researched a lot of things. I also uh, have self-published a series called Sub Rosa America, for which I spent a decade uh, researching the deep politics of the United States to figure out what had happened to this country uh, between now and, and when I was a little girl. So uh, I spent quite a bit of time collecting data on all manner of things having to do with politics. And I had two files, one on chemtrails, one on HARP, the High Frequency Active Auroral Research Project up in Gakona, Alaska. And at that time, I didn't know that they were connected. I didn't know enough. And I was living in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and as life would have it, as destiny would have it, I became good friends with Clifford Carnicum, the independent scientist who really was the first one in the late 90s who was collecting uh, debris coming down from the chemical trails being laid over northern New Mexico. Clifford was operating on a shoestring budget, he had been a Department of Defense and uh, uh, Bureau of Land Management scientist, but had quit those uh, large agencies and was on his own. So we would go out to breakfast every few weeks, and we would end up talking about uh, the chemical trails and what he was finding uh, dropping from them and was able to prove was actually dropping from them. And what he concentrated on were the fibers that uh, were really impossible to destroy, and uh, he had a lot of trouble breaking into them. They were on a nano scale, so he needed very fine equipment, some of which he had, some of which he constructed uh, out of necessity, uh, and he was uh, collecting people's saliva and blood at that time, and I was one of his uh, uh, participants and I remember giving him my saliva after I did what he calls the red wine test and um, then we saw the fibers in that and then from my blood uh, we watched under a high powered microscope as this uh, what he had decided was a genetically engineered creature uh, was eating the iron right out of my red blood cells. And I had heard that oxygen was about 16% less in human beings than it had been 20 years ago. And, uh, and I saw it right there under the microscope that I had this Morgellons creature in me. Um, Morgellons, in most people uh, who know they have it, uh, it makes uh, very deep lesions in the skin. Uh, probably the body's uh, desire to throw them off. And uh, I don't have that, but I know that they're in me. And I know that I have breathed them from the chemical trails. So that was really my first real life experience of uh, the chemical trails high over my head. And after that, when I moved back up to the Pacific Northwest, a publisher uh, I'd done some work for when I lived in England asked me if I thought I could write a book on chemtrails. And I agreed to do that, particularly since I'd been such good friends with Clifford, and I knew he could guide me in some aspects of it. 
So I began to research that, and that was about 2012. And uh, the book finally came out in 2014. Uh, and um, since then, I have just finished the sequel to it on the space fence. Uh, and um, that will be out in September 2017, uh, my publisher tells me. Oh, boy, that is wonderful. Elena, you know, you've really dug this, uh, dug out a lot of uh, very interesting and insightful uh, topics and subjects in, in your, your research, have you not? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, the interesting thing about research in this area, which is, by the way, uh, if your listeners don't know, a national security issue. This is a highly classified project, uh, including the chemical trails and what is being loaded into them <coughs> to be dropped <coughs> down to the earth. And um, instead, when you listen to like the COP20, uh, COP21 that was the conference in Paris last December, some some listeners may have. Uh, followed that. It was a big climate conference that there had been many smaller conferences uh, preparing for that conference because it was there that they signed off on uh, the carbons tax that all nations have to pay according to the uh, their carbons pollution, etc. And um, this is this is a big deal because this is a big money maker. And uh, the, they had been building toward this for the two decades that this program has been running. It's a geoengineering program uh, that they always say they may have to do because of climate change uh, and um, the, the, the heavy uh, penalty of carbons uh, from our automobiles and, uh, of course, military use, et cetera. So um, this is – this was – at, at these conferences, it's never mentioned uh, how this program has been, has been up and running for two decades without uh, citizen uh, uh, confirmation, without ever asking citizens about it. And uh, I believe that it is uh, a series of experiments that they're running on humanity, on the forests, on the soil, on all life forms in the biosphere in order to um, make their provisions for a future that uh, will really be, if they have their way, a synthetic reality replacing the natural reality. And that's, that's only one of uh, the operations going on under these uh, chemical trails. And I, I could, George, if you'd like, uh, refresh uh, your listeners' memory about what this, uh, what, what it means to have the chemicals coming out of the combustion chamber. Yes, yes, do that. Plant. Elena, that's a very interesting. Do that. All right, because this is, it's, it's not just as a, uh, the sort of flotsam and jetsam that is, uh, would come as debris out of combustion chambers of jet engines because we're so addicted to, uh, fast and easy travel at, at high altitudes. No, this is a military program that has now um, brought in uh, uh, the commercial jet corporations. And so it's not just military jets that are laying these trails. It's, it's commercial as well. So this is a real moneymaker for a lot of corporate uh, – of the corporations in the military-industrial complex. But when, when these – uh, th this fuel is burned, and it's gone all the way from JP4 to JP8 fuel. It's specially treated. It's so specially treated that uh, much of the many of the ingredients in the in the fuel are classified, and that means they're military. That means they're national security. So we know we who are the researchers in the chemtrails movement. Uh, despite all the name calling of conspiracy theorists and and uh, and now they're using some other term false news. Despite all that, uh, we, we're on the trail of a uh, of a classified project that entails human beings breathing in chemicals coming from the combustion chamber of jet engines, and those those 
compounds that are being spewed in the uh, high altitudes are really uh, purposeful. They're not just what you have to breathe because you love jet airplanes and they have to fly on something. It's not about that only. It is uh, about seven different projects, seven different operations that the military has going. Uh, and uh, I, I certainly owe it to Clifford Carnicum in his 2005 film, Aer uh, Aerosol Crimes, for spelling out the, uh, these divisions. So I've just run briefly over them. Yes, go ahead. The first one is, of course, weather modification. And uh, we are already experiencing and have been now for, uh, I'd say, a decade and a half of this. Uh, we have uh, engineered weather. And uh, this, this technology, starting with the chemical trails, and the next uh, part of it would be the ionospheric heaters like HARP and uh, various uh, radar installations with uh, being able to zap lasers and microwave uh, it are part of the ability to move weather systems, even to move and modify the jet stream that we so depend upon to move our weather systems from west to east. So that's, that's a huge part of this. And the weather systems are very experimental, at least from my vantage point. I see that they are experimenting. Every year seems to have a different theme. We've had the hurricane theme. We've had the tornado theme. We've had um, ice nucleation theme, flooding. All of these, uh, drought would be one very particular one uh, in California. All of these are, uh, are not accidental. These are not acts of God. These are all uh, anthropogenic, they're man-made, they're man-conceived. And, um, of course, w control over the weather can be a very astute political and economic warfare instrument. Certainly you can see how it could be used politically to force nations to obey, to submit to uh, various things, or they will be hit with weather that will... Uh, drag their economy down into the dirt. So uh, that's part of how it's used. It's used economically uh, as actually either to destroy an economy or to even boost an economy because, for example, after Hurricane Katrina in 2005, uh, in came the Halliburtons, all the construction companies, the poor were moved out of their homes because they were destroyed or flooded, and, uh, and the real estate was sold for a pittance of what it was worth because people were in an emergency situation. And um, many of the insurance companies make a fortune off of this. The weather derivatives uh, out of the Chicago Mercantile make a fortune out of um, what Naomi Klein years ago called disaster capitalism. And this, uh, this is how you could use weather modification, and it is being used. Uh, the second operation, military in nature, is the environmental geophysical modification. And this, too, is, uh, again, very interesting. Uh, going back to Hurricane Katrina down in the Gulf of Mexico, you remember how there was the, uh, the oil spill down there and how they infused a chemical called core exit into the Gulf in order to gobble up uh, the oil spill. Uh, well, that's turned into a massive disaster, very, very profitable for the uh, petrochemical com companies uh, and all the people along the shoreline of the Gulf of Mexico, their real estate, they've lost real estate They've uh, because the core exit actually eats uh, along shorelines. Uh, and so... Um, this ability to alter uh, the uh, thre threshold of land. Um, in recently, we had a big uh, 7.8 earthquake on South Island in New Zealand, and it is my theory, and theory only at this point, that New Zealand is possibly being terraformed for uh, a different type of island 
uh, split between the Chinese in the north and the Americans in the south. Um, so that's another operation we're going to see a lot more of uh, through um, collapsing sinkholes, salt domes, collapsing uh, shorelines of, of various uh, 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 waters like the Atlantic and the Gulf. Uh, and so that's how we can look at it as an operation run by the military. The third uh, would be the electromagnetic operations, which go all the way into the near-Earth orbit. So what we're talking about is this is a this this ability to change the atmosphere down where we are in the lower atmosphere is also going on up in space in the near earth orbit uh between here and the and the edge of the ionosphere and so um many many experiments are being run in near earth orbit that people are blaming on aliens and uh, et and and uh you know whatever they can come up with without knowing the science because we're not being taught this science we're not being informed uh, there's a huge cover-up going that, oh, this is climate change, this is global warming, uh, disaster is coming if we don't cough up our carbon taxes. So um, this uh, electromagnetic operations goes all the way to making uh, uh, sprites out of lightning, um, uh, making Birkeland currents, uh, drawing them down into our lower atmosphere. Many things that used to go on higher up are now being done right above our heads and so we hear hums and growls and trumpet sounds coming from we don't know where it's actually coming from the earth because they're able to uh to do tomography which is also altering the earth um many many electromagnetic operations are available now because the atmosphere has been entirely electrified by the combination of the chemicals coming out of jet and airplanes and the radio frequency or microwaves or lasers that are zapping them and uh, electrifying of the sky so that when we see those trails coming out of the jets that then filter out, spread out into a cirrus cloud cover. They stay up there for, for, de for hours, don't they? Oh, they stay. I mean, the the trails themselves are not contrails. There is no water vapor. In no, a water vapor trail would disappear in a matter of a few seconds, 15, exactly. 20 seconds. But these stay up there for hours and become clouds, you know. They do. And that cloud cover is chemical in nature. That's the important thing. Right, here. right. When you look up, you're not looking at the same cirrus cloud cover you might have experienced 30, 40 years ago, uh, which would have had... A very, you know, particulates in it and water vapor. No, these are, this is all particulates that have been electrified uh, in an, an atmosphere that we're now forced to breathe. And that atmosphere is electrical in nature. It's like, it's like a battery. It's like turning the entire sky into an antenna. It's like there's a Tesla dome over us now. Of, uh, of an electromagnetic nature for military operations. And I think that you can see how these military operations are, if they're classified, who's going to talk about them anywhere, at any conference, in any mainstream media newspaper. It's just simply not going to be talked about. And in fact, um, the military is using this for a, their own C4 operations, and that's command, control, communications, and cyber warfare. This is what they need this for, many, many, many wireless operations. And it's probably behind how finally consumers were given the cell phones uh, about what, what in the, was it the late 90s or 2000, somewhere around there. We were given the cell phones that the military had had for decades uh, because they needed more of the cell towers to go up. They needed those towers. The uh, Gwen system, the ground wave emergency network, was simply not enough. Uh, they needed more. And now it's not just the cell towers that you can tell are cell towers. They're dis disguising them as uh, as fir trees and crosses on churches and all manner of things. And I, now I hear that there are very tiny ones that they're putting up everywhere that are disguised. So um, they they needed us to join them with our complicity 
and get those cell phones uh, that we cannot do without. I personally do not own one simply uh, <laughs> simply because I know this. I know what the purpose is. And um, this this is part of the fourth operation, military operations, in what the military calls dual use. They use the consumer's side of the technology so that all telecommunications companies like AT&T, uh, Verizon, et cetera, all of them are military contractors now. This is the militarization of civilian life, and it's being done very covertly, sort of slow-boiling frog style, but it is being done. And when Dr. Rosalie Bertel was still alive, an, an amazing epidemiologist uh, and, and a nun, uh, she specialized in ionizing radiation, and she understood this danger very well in her book, Planet Earth, The La Latest Weapon of War, a critical study into the military and the environment. And she said this, and I quote, the ability of the HARP slash space lab slash rocket combination to deliver very large amounts of energy comparable to a nuclear bomb anywhere on Earth by means of laser and particle beams is frightening, end of quote. And that's what lies behind this technology as well. Among the military operations are weapons of extraordinary power that we now know are called directed energy weapons. Well, now, you wrote an article recently for Nixus magazine, Electromagnetic Weapons. Is that right? Yes, I did, and I wrote that in 2014. I've gotten a lot of okay. people have contacted me about that because these directed energy weapons, if you want to know what they look like, I think of uh, TWA Flight 800. I think of the Space Shuttle Challenger. Okay. I think of the 9-11 Towers. That okay, went right. And okay. these are all, in my opinion, these are all directed energy weapons that we didn't know what we were looking at. Right, 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 exactly. Being hidden from the public. I, I uh, think Judy Wood and I both agreed uh, when I we interviewed her for two hours a while back that they have the technology, we think, to neutralize this Fukushima radiation, but we, we don't think they're going to do that because it would uncover some of their top secret weapon systems. What do you think? I think that's very possible, and um, I assume you and Judy might have uh, touched upon this amazing, to me, uh, Iran Iranian scientist, um, Dr. Keshe, K-E-S-H-E. He claims to have approached Japan after the Fukushima catastrophe, which, by the way, I maintain in my Chemtrails Heart book was a harp operation. Uh, he, may, he, he presented to the Japanese government a technology he has come up with that would have completely erased all radiation, and he was uh, refused. And I, I don't know what that's about, uh, and I can only imagine that some of this technology, as Judy Wood says in her really great book, uh, Where Did the Towers Go?, uh, it could be used for good, such as yes, ameliorating, it it, ameliorating hurricanes and tornadoes. Right. I mean, it could be, but because the military is in charge of this program now and virtually of our atmosphere and our near-Earth orbit, uh, that's not going to happen because they're weaponizing everything they can lay their hands on. Well, you know, in your title of your book, you use full-spectrum dominance. That actually is a military term. It is. It's a doctrine. It's that's very, right. It comes out of the dimensions of the battle space, see? Yeah, that's right. And, and it goes terrestrial, uh, aerial, maritime, subterranean, now, and so forth. Now, let me ask you another question here that has come up. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, yes. it figures prominently in this whole scenario, does it not? Yeah. What is, is that the NGA? Yeah, uh, it's the National Geospatial Intelligence a Agency. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's what it is, NGA, yeah, the NGA. for short. Yeah, that's well, right. A, yeah, that's right. It reminds me of uh, when uh, the, uh, oh, what was the name of it? We had another agency that was secret for about 30 years. Nobody even knew it existed that was handling 
all of the things in the near Well, they position. had the National Reconnaissance Office. Yes, the And I, th I think that exactly. preceded this National uh, Geospatial Intelligence Agency. But I think, well, this, did it replace it, or I think the uh, the NRO is still is still running. It may be, but uh, it might be more administrative than anything. But this this okay. new uh, spatial thing has a has a capability. It has the third largest building in the Washington D.C. area. Yes. Oh, no, you're absolutely right, George. The yeah. NGA yeah. is a real sleeper, yes. and we've yes. got to keep our eyes on it. And I, I haven't really, I have it in the Space Fence book. I go into it uh, for a few pages. Right. But I haven't really explored who, uh, who is on its board. That you know, needs to that, be done. That's, uh, that's, that is something that is, is, is bigger than, uh, I got onto it years ago when one of my men out of there, out of the, uh, uh, Washington DC area put me onto it, you know, one of my advisors. Great, great. And, um, so, so the military operations, uh, that's the fourth operation. Okay, okay. That I yeah, right. Uh, it's, it's huge. And sure. it's, it's all encompassing. So that when we see meteors falling from the sky, we're told they're meteors. I, I highly think they are not meteors. I think they are, again, plasma is being, uh, experimented with, uh, in, in our, in our lower troposphere. And in the stratosphere. So uh, let me talk a little just at that point about plasma. Sure, go plasma. ahead. Yeah, People go ahead. People don't realize what plasma is. So they think of the plasma in their blood. It, this is different. Right. This is the fourth state of matter, and uh, it often uh, presents as a gas. First, it can be a gas, and it can also be a fire. It has substance to it, but it's difficult to see uh, with our senses. So we now have instruments that can detect plasma and can create plasma. Uh, and uh, when we're looking up at the sky, what we're seeing in that cirrus cloud cover I mentioned that is, is uh, absolutely moisture free and is particularly dry as chemicals can be, um, what we're looking at is a plasma formation, a gas formation of plasma. And this plasma can, with radio frequency and being zapped by various things, can be made to be quite substantial. It can, uh, I think I've seen pictures, I, you know, I certainly uh, am amazed of clouds, uh, just, just solo clouds sitting on the earth that have somehow sort of cruised down to the, the terrestrial and simply rest there. And when people have attempted to touch them, their hand goes straight through. Uh, this this reminds me of photographs I, I've seen from the 19th century when Sir William Crookes, who is considered to be the father of, of modern chemistry, he was also an avid occultist, uh, and uh, I think he was a Freemason, and he certainly uh, was involved in uh, what we call table tapping or um, seances and that sort of thing. And I remember seeing photographs of ectoplasm forming uh, from a clairvoyant that uh, was uh, a substance and uh, would be sort of uh, take on the uh, ghostly figure of a human being. And I can't help but feel that this was plasma and that it was somehow contrived to, uh, to be created uh, uh, by crooks somehow because he's always in those photographs. So, uh, so it's a chemical uh, creation, plasma. It's a heat creation, and our our skies are now loaded with plasma. And now now comes uh, the uh, many experiments on plasma. Uh, that the scientists are pursuing with great gusto. And many of these scientists, if you're wondering why you're not hearing from them, uh, they've not only signed confidentiality agreements because all of this is classified, but um, they're also operating on a need-to-know basis, so they probably don't realize what the other scientists are doing. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. Uh, and, um, and it's a completely uh, military grant um, moneyed 
if this is not it's taxpayer money yes but it's it's under the aegis of the military because all of this technology is being militarized to be used uh for quote defense unquote but i would say it's being used for aggression and um so the plasma part is really important because uh this can uh if all the universe is made of plasma and and it's about 99.9% of the universe um then then we are too and and we are subject to uh these experiments as well in our our physical bodies so um so it's a great concern to me what the military is doing with this um this this gets to the fifth operation the biological operations i mentioned what clifford carnicom was doing by the way you can read all his papers on this at carnicominstitute.org um Clifford uh was talking about the Morgellons creature, the genetically engineered creature uh which is um uh he's renamed the cross domain bacteria because it actually has portions of all three kingdoms of nature in it. Uh and uh then there's uh, also coming down our fungi, fungi uh from uh the upper atmosphere which we are breathing in all on a nanoparticulate level you're not going to be able to see these particles they're very very tiny we now will hear uh from um NASA or or even um Google uh Microsoft whoever that they are releasing trillions of of nano sized sensors into the environment which can be remotely uh contacted to it download the data they're collecting we are breathing in those sensors as well there are microprocessors now on the nano scale i assume that these sensors are all loaded with microprocessors how else can they be remotely contacted and and be able to download the information they're taking in those sensors uh, with microprocessors are in our bloodstream they're in our tissues Uh, I assume they can be uh still remotely contacted by guys uh at their laptops sitting in Denver or or having a piña colada down in uh Phoenix. So um so this is our this is our condition. Uh and all of this is biological because it's impacting all of the biosphere. Everyone, every living creature is impacted by this irresponsible program. that when i had there've been no no experiments on nanotechnology it's all gung ho it's the typical attitude in america of the military and the corporations of gee let's try it and see what happens it's as though we're all expendables in these experiments they insist on subjecting citizens to they can't do it by by international laws they can't just go into other countries and do it though they do try that i'm sure but they they that's why they'll experiment on their own people if you were wondering and another question i get i might as well deal with it now is why would they do this given that their children are going to suffer from this they're going to suffer from this they're going to be breathing the same stuff we're breathing well my opinion is uh first of all they're building uh the elites the global elites are building their mansions underground now that's been made public so uh they obviously know something uh about what's what's going on uh above us and um i would imagine that just as they did with aids which was created by the world health organization with the assistance of dr robert gallo i assume they have the antidote and they're able to um take a pill get a shot uh breathe some from a machine um have tremendously powerful hepa filters on their homes i assume uh that that they've got that handled and that uh you know if you're in the in crowd you're going to know about this technology and you're not just going to make a lot of money off of it but you're also going to be able to protect those those that you love so uh, that would be my answer to that so the biological goes all the way from the morgellons or the cross domain bacteria to the fungi uh it it also includes polymers there there is a polymer sheath on the cross domain bacteria and uh we're breathing those in as well they're in our bodies 
and uh, all of this is uh, challenging our immune system. Now add uh, Monsanto's GMO program. As you know, Monsanto came out with an aluminum resistant seed exactly uh, when the chemtrails started flying. Uh, and the chemtrails are loaded with aluminum oxide and all on a nanoscale. So um, uh, GMO, GMOs and uh, Monsanto GMOs uh, and other uh, GMOs from other corporations in the chemical business, they're all delivery systems as well. I can only imagine what kinds of chemical signatures are in the foods that most people eat. I eat all organic. I never, uh, if I go to a restaurant, I will be eating GMOs, I'm sure. But I go rarely and and I eat very well and attempt to ameliorate, minimize what is going on and how the environment around me has been weaponized. Um, Different pathogens will probably be piggybacked onto these these mylar uh, polymer fibers, uh, not just the cross-domain bacteria. So uh, I, I think we all have to think uh, of our bloodstream and, um, and our immune system as, uh, as in, a, in a precarious, assaulted uh, world now. And we have to take care of them. We can't wait for our doctors to do that. If you go with a lesion that looks the least Morgellons to a doctor and you see little fibers uh, sticking their heads out of these lesions and you tell the doctor that he's going to send you the psych ward uh, and say that you have uh, his diagnosis will be delusional parasitosis he will not take a sample from the lesions and put them under a high powered microscope well, some, some of those fibers as I understand it are not able to be typed even see uh, not able to yeah. be typed yeah some of the uh, some of the yeah. fibers coming up are synthetic clear looking and uh, I understand that we had a Margellans tasting party years ago at Brave New Books here in Austin. Yeah. And uh, all of us that took the test, we didn't do the wine, but we did the grape juice uh, test. Yeah. And all of us came up with fibers in our blood. That's right. And, and, I- and uh, then, of course, uh, at that time, and this was years ago, they weren't able to type uh, the fibers that were coming up out of these sores of Magellan, uh victims or patients. Well, I know one thing, George. Yeah. Uh, when Clifford started his research, like he was uh, around the early 2000s when he was deep into it. Well, I interviewed him he, and another lady, I believe, back then. Uh huh. Yeah. I don't know if he told you about the the 186 hits he got uh, on his site from all the Alphabet Soup uh, agencies. In I didn't Washington. know. I didn't know about that. I haven't been in contact with him. Yes. Lately. I mean that was that was an eye opener. Right. I mean, if if they can, they know what these are. Somebody knows what right, these are. Right. So if you go to the doctor, yeah, a lot of doctors are not on board. They're not insiders. They don't know what this is. They they're not being told by the AMA. They're not. It's not in the DSM uh, five or whatever it is that, that the psychiatrists operate out of. Right. Uh, I mean, this is all uh, this is all classified. Yes, and it that is. That leaves that leaves the people. Uh, in fear, and I mean, families are falling apart, uh, marriages are ending, uh, communities are are at risk because uh, we're being so lied to. It's it's just got to end. Well, you know, uh, though, Steve, uh, you know, uh, Quell has that dead uh, scientist list on his site. Yes. And they there were just uh, there's over a hundred people on the list, and I think seventy to eighty percent are microbiologists. Yes, well, that's from years ago, and yeah. now what's happening is there's a spate of, I think it's up to 17 or so now, naturopaths and physicians. Oh, okay, are yes. Route. They're all dead. Right, they they all got right. on to what's going on on the global scale, and they were liquidated, it seems like to me. That's what I yes. think. See. And if I were to point a finger, I would have to point it at the medical industry uh-huh. and Big Pharma. Uh, right, that's right. where I would point to look first. So now, all right, yeah, biological. go ahead. Okay. That, but now I'm on number six okay. of the operations is intelligence and surveillance. Okay. Operations. And this, this is where we get into the space fence. Um, what we have going up around us here on, on planet Earth uh, that we can see is a smart grid. And the smart grid 
uh, utilizes uh, smart meters, um, the cell phone towers, the uh, Nexrad, uh, big golf ball looking uh, radons, uh, radomes uh, that you'll see near radio stations in your area. Uh, uh, big uh, golf ball looking um, uh, they're really uh, ionospheric heaters is what they are uh, they're on um, uh, on oil rigs they're offshore uh, they're mobile uh, many of them now are getting smaller in size because they're really working on this technology to get this smart grid absolutely perfect and tuned and ready to go you're talking about wind farms talking about fracking all of these have the same chemical signatures going into the ground that is being dropped on us from the sky all of them are being pulsed being calibrated to pulse at a certain frequency that it resonates as an entire huge machine is really what it is here on earth this smart grid well this te right, now, technocracy seems to come to me patrick woods yeah uh, came up they're building a technocracy here you know well, what I mean? The, that's what they're doing. Yes, that's the human part. Right, that's right. That's the part that we're going to experience instead of democracy. Yeah, a technocracy, technocracy. which they'll regulate energy and all these smart meters and, and uh, you know, have us on a, some kind of a plan, right? That's right. That's yeah. right. That's all part of Agenda Agenda right. 21. Yes. It's going to be named yes. Agenda 2030. Yes, 2030 now. Throw that bone out to us. That right, it's going right. To be done by 2030 which means it'll be done much sooner. Whenever they give us a long leash into the future, you know that they're just about done. Exactly. And I would say that everything's going to be ready by next year. 2017 is the big year. Okay. Um, and this, this whole ground uh, instrument, uh, the smart grid, is going to be calibrated exactly to CERN and uh, the space fence. Now, let me... Define the space fence. Okay. Because um, intelligence and surveillance is the name of the game with the space fence. But when we think intelligence and surveillance, we're thinking, okay, satellites can read our license plates. Satellites can read a postage stamp on a letter. Uh, they know where we are. Uh, Edward Snowden came out and told us that, though I, I knew about it 10 years before. Uh, they know exactly where we are. They've got the GPS sa uh, satellites. They're protecting them uh, to within an inch of their lives because without the GPS, they'll be blind. Uh, so uh, everything's set up now. And what is happening in order to uh, make sure that this is a lockdown on planet Earth is the, uh, the sounding rockets that are being sent skyward for various um, – Either it's the private corporation sending them like Elon Musk's uh, uh, SpaceX or it's military uh, sounding rockets that have various experiments they're running at the near in the near Earth orbit. But what what they're spewing behind them when they're uh, going skyward is not just uh, the, the flotsam and jetsam that has to come from uh, a powerful uh, combustion going on to get the rocket up there. That too is classified. That formula for that that uh, that particular fuel is classified. And in it, you can count on it. You can take it to the bank that they're going to have aluminum oxide in it. They're going to have lithium in it. Uh, they're going to probably have titanium in it. And all that spewing, not only is it going right over the people who are unfortunate enough to have their ho homes in that flight pattern, but it's going to go up to near-Earth orbit, and it's going to start circling the planet for however long before the rocket comes back down. But during that process, all of the, those nanoparticulates of conductive metals like aluminum, lithium, and titanium, they're all going to go in they're going to they're going to go around the earth uh, the edge and then they're going to fall into centrifugal force and they're going to be caught and they're going to be sent down toward the equator and around the equator is a ring forming and if i were to be in space so i could see that ring it would look a lot like saturn's rings okay 
and that yeah. is that's going to be the uh, the the sort of sandwiching effect between the ground system of the smart grid. Remember, everything's calibrated to work with everything else. That smart grid now has the space fence up around the Earth, okay. uh, orbiting around the equator as a sort of, again, an antenna, and a really powerful antenna, given that our atmosphere is completely ionized now, completely plasmaized, between uh, the ground system and the sky system, uh, you have a, a very powerful well forming around the Earth that activated, if, it, if indeed they wish to activate the entire thing at once with the exact right frequency pulsed at the exact right calibration, you're going to have a Tesla dome around the entire Earth. And that's why I call this next book The uh, Space Fence Lockdown. This lockdown will not only be for surveillance in space of space junk and incoming uh, missiles and whatever they want to say, uh, but it's also the eyes in the sky are turned toward the Earth so that all of the Earth can be controlled by an AI system, artificial intelligence. That is... That this is this is what the SDI program had hoped under Reagan, Cheney, and George H. W. Bush. This was their this was their plan back in '83, but they had to table it because they did not have that ionized sky. They didn't have it. They had to create HARP with uh, Bernard Eastland's patent first in order to get into the ionosphere, bubble it out, pull our suck our atmosphere up into the ionosphere, pull it back down, and get it where it got a really juicy start here on uh, in the uh, troposphere that then they could keep activated by lasers, by radiation, uh, including, yes, radiation like the Fukushima thing. All of these ionized and non-ionized radiation uh, instruments our hands on deck now to keep the atmosphere ionized. And what they're really kind of interested in, I think, is who can evolve, how many human beings, given that they think we're just weak and need massive enhancement, how many human beings will be able to evolve to handle an atmosphere of radiation? They're not concerned that the forests will die, and they are dying in, um, in California. They're not concerned because we'll be eating GMO foods that are created uh, out, of a, out of a test tube, and, uh, and they, can, they can now, uh, because of the uh, genome project and the genetic information, the DNA signatures that they know and they're, have been collecting for, for decades, they know how to how to make uh, faults for us. They can they can recreate for us. They can recreate anything. So they're not concerned about the destruction factor that is going on now as they push toward a future in which we will all be controlled, all have a hive mind, and they'll be able to pick out individuals and program them individually while the rest of the population is pulsed with a sort of compliance, with a, a sort of a weakened. Uh, will and and the the whole dream of the Renaissance of the Reformation of the Enlightenment all that European uh, impulse that came in hundreds of years ago uh, just forget it human beings are to be a hive mind under an AI system that's it that's transhumanism and that uh, is what I believe this is we're, what we're witnessing now is the attempt to lift this this sort of uh, Promethean dream of these elites to be able to have the technology that can really do empire, really do global control. Um, and and that's, that's how I see that. That sixth uh, intelligence surveillance, you've got to, we've got to redefine surveillance to, to see that it actually has to do with control right down to the DNA level, especially now that they have terahertz waves, mm -hmm. the ones that you experience when you fly and you go through TSA. It's, it's actually shredding your DNA as you go through. Right. Uh, 
So, uh, so that's the sixth one. And let me just quickly finish the seventh, which is the most far out. Okay. And it gets right down to the uh, space, uh, the space age. Um, Clifford and I came up with this together, I believe. It was the seventh operation added to the sixth, and that is the detection and obscuration of exotic uh, propulsion uh, systems. And what we mean by this is, is uh, certainly uh, we have had anti-gravity uh, ships since the uh, we brought the Nazis over under Operation Paperclip. There's no, no doubt in my mind about that. Uh, anti-gravity, uh, you know, that, that would be Townsend Brown's ideas. That would be the ideas of Tesla. I mean, all stolen, all stolen uh, ideas. And now that the atmosphere is ionized and is particle rich, uh, and you need particles in order to, uh, to have... Uh, uh, this sort of technology work, then we can we can have these ships, but we're not ready to tell the secret that we have these ships. And so, uh, a lot of people are seeing triangular ships in some of these plasma clouds. They're actually seeing plasma clouds seemingly creating more plasma, as if it were exhaust. Uh, given the cloaking technology that the military has. I don't need to import ET or aliens in order to imagine that uh, we are we are unable to see uh, many of these these ships uh, these uh, vector ships uh, in the air in up in in our clouds. Um, also, they may be using it with their plasma sensitive instruments to really see other uh, nations' ships and possibly interdimensional ships. I, I'm not going to eliminate that simply because they've coded it with fantasy and silliness. Uh, possible interdimensional ships coming in because of, we now have a plasma-rich environment that uh, would be very friendly to them. So uh, this is a possibility, and, and we're living to see it. Uh, which for me is is quite remarkable that um, that I would live in a time where so much is in transition, so much is is um, uh, you know the misfortune of leaving so much behind. Uh, I'm very sad about that, and I I know it's not necessary. If we had leaders who were dedicated to developing humanity and helping it in its evolution in consciousness, uh, we would be fortunate indeed. We have a technology that could do amazing things, but what's it being used for? It's being armed. It's being militarized one more time. Um, so that's that's how those seven operations are all served by this technology that is never mentioned in the press or at any conference that, that I've, I've heard of. Uh, and, I, and I know it's all going on right now. Wow, well, gosh. Boy, that was, that was quite, a, quite a, uh, a pronouncement and speech and lecture that you gave us today. This space fence, uh, it has uh, recently been, uh, what, uh, finished? Is that right, this book? Well, they're they're finishing up. Uh, I can't pronounce it. I always forget it. But the Kwajalein uh, Atoll out in the South Pacific. Oh yes, uh huh. Yes, it's going up. I think that uh, it uh, also there's a Ronald Reagan um, installation there. I can't remember what it is, but that that's going up. They've had the space fence around. We had it running uh, through the um, south and uh, going southwest, uh, but this. This, it, it, as I said, it, it really didn't have the power that was needed until the ionized atmosphere. This oh. has given the keys of the kingdom to the military on the SDI program, the Star Wars program. Right. You know, the uh, uh, I'm looking now. We have this up on our site uh, to complement your 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 just great uh, speech and and uh, lecture uh, this evening. But uh, we have. Uh, uh, a LockheedMartin.com site, and there's photographs there of their site there out there in the Marshall Islands, and um, so we're going to make that that's being part of your program tonight, and right. and um, you know your your depth of knowledge and research is just phenomenal 
uh, Elena, and I, man, I must thank you for for all the work you've you've. Yeah, I know you've spent endless hours in researching this. Absolutely, it and, is, and and it's like um, it's like the legend of Isis and Osiris, isn't it? Where Osiris yeah. is killed by Set, and his body is strewn all over the delta, and she has to go and look at every piece to put every piece back together. That's how I've felt. It's a collage uh, experience, and if it had not been for D- Billy Hayes, the harp man, right. I, I would have been working at it much longer. He was invaluable to me because he's a hands-on uh, tower erector, and he worked for years for military contractors who worked for uh, three-letter CI, uh, three-letter agencies. Yeah. Well, we'll have to have another and, program and incorporate him into that next time, yes. and I think that would add a great deal too uh, to a wider you know, perspective and so forth and so on. Yeah. Uh, I came out of the Army Security Agency out of Germany, West Berlin, and so I had just a very small experience level uh, back uh, when I was in my 20s, you know, because oh, we, wow. we worked for the NSA back then. Oh, yes. And uh, then they morphed this into the INSCOM, which is Intelligence Security Command, which changed things. But uh, so we we were we were not into these issues though we were into just communications interception and signal intelligence uh, interception stuff like that. Right. But but so so uh, you have about a minute or two. Uh, could you give us some concluding remarks then? About two minutes. Well, my hope is that people will not just immediately go into fear over this information. Every era that we live in, we human beings live in, has its challenges. For instance, in the Middle Ages, it would have been perhaps the Catholic Church uh, and domination of the church. Now we have the domination of a military that is militarizing everything, and that would include the military-industrial intelligence complex that Eisenhower attempted to warn us of on his way out of office. So a lot, a lot of water has flowed under the bridge no fear, no fear, no fear. I have no fear. On we go. And we must have the knowledge so that we can make the decisions for our lives and our children's lives and our grandchildren's lives and prepare them for the world that is already on its way. Well, Elena, well, thank you. That was a very, very beautiful concluding statement there. We want to thank you again for being with us this evening. And uh, we've got all the information about your book up there. We've added a few of these other click-offs. Uh, on the space fence, and certainly we're we're waiting anxiously for the release and publishing of your next book entitled Space Fence. Okay. All right. Thank you, George. Okay, Elena. Thank you very much. Good night.